If you would turn to Matthew chapter 24, Matthew chapter 24 is where we're going to begin tonight. Hmm. <clears throat> the title of the message this evening, for those that are taking notes, is Who is Jesus? Hmm. Who is Jesus? Now, some of you might think, duh, hmm. I, know, I know who Jesus is. Hmm. And that may very well be true. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we just want to thank you again for your precious word. Mm -hmm. Lord, I pray that we would have open hearts, open minds, that we would be receptive to what you teach us this evening. Lord, help us to uh, not drift away in our, in our minds. Let's pay attention because there's some very important things that will need to be implemented if we're going to really know who Jesus is. I pray your blessing on our time now. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Many people have claimed to be Jesus Christ over the centuries. There are some today who claim to be Jesus or Jesus reincarnated. All you got to do is do a Google search and you'll be amazed at what you find. As a result, many people have been deceived, disappointed, and turned away from the truth. Living in the information age, we have access to an unprecedented amount of information, both good and bad. Our children are especially vulnerable to deception and false information and false teachers. Jesus warned us these things would happen in Matthew chapter 24, verses 4 and 5. Jesus said, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. In verse 11, Jesus said, And many false prophets shall arise, and shall deceive many. In verse 24, Jesus said, For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs. That word signs means miracles. Shall show great miracles and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. That's the chosen. That's the true born-again Christian. You say, how can that be possible? Well, today's shallow Christianity and lack of biblical knowledge make it far easier for people to be deceived by false preachers and false teachers. Now, the word deceive in these verses is the Greek word planaho. It can mean to roam, as in to roam from safety, to roam from truth, to roam from virtue. It can also mean to go astray, to err, to seduce, to wonder. The related word, plan A, means fraudulence, a strain from orthodoxy or piety, delusion, error. And the root word, planos, means an imposter or misleader. In other words, deception can happen in many ways. Now, why am I going in depth to define one word? Because here Jesus tells us how people will be deceived. For many, they'll be deceived because they decided to roam from the truth. They decided to check out other teaching that sounds good. You would turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Hold your place here. Actually, you don't need to hold your place here, but turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. I want you to see this. It 
2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. That word endure means put up with. For the time will come when they will not put up with sound doctrine. But after their own lust, they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned to fables. Many will go astray because they'll be seduced away from the truth by fraudulent means. Many of today's TV and internet teachers are frauds and false prophets. And as people roam and stray away from orthodox Bible doctrine, and that's a big word, orthodox, what does that mean? In this context, orthodox means the accepted or traditional and established faith. So as people roam and stray away from the established faith, they will believe and practice error. Now back to Matthew chapter 24, there's another word that needs to be defined, another very important word. In verse 11, Jesus uses the word rise. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. In verse 24, Jesus uses the word arise. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets. This is a significant word. Remember here, Jesus is describing how people will be deceived. The word in both of these verses comes from the Greek Agiro, which means, now listen to this, to waken, that is, to rouse from sleep, from disease, from death, to raise up again. So why is that so important? With today's artificial intelligence, avatars, and robotic humanoids becoming ever more lifelike, it's not a far stretch to envision great signs, great miracles and wonders that will make it seem like people are cured from disease or raised from the dead. There will come a time very soon when fake healers will seem to be real healers. There will come a time when it will look like people are being raised from the dead. And that's a rapid trail that I could have gone on, and I started going on it when I prepared my notes, and I decided to just leave it for another day. because That's not the intent of my message tonight. But Satan has many ways to deceive people. Today, he also has cutting-edge technology that he will use to prepare the world and to prepare the way for the Antichrist. Be very careful who you listen to and what you believe. Now the question I asked a few minutes ago, which is the title of the message, is who is Jesus? Now the Bible makes it very plain who Jesus is. As long as we stay within the confines of Scripture and don't roam and stray away from the clear teaching of the Bible, we can stand upon the solid rock that we just sang about a few minutes ago and have complete confidence <coughs> that we will not be deceived. Now that was just by way of introduction, showing the negative side of this, the things to be aware of and to be wary of. But if you would, turn to our text verse this evening, John chapter 14 and verse 6. John chapter 14 and verse 6. Very familiar passage of scripture. 
but I hope to share it in such a way tonight that it opens your understanding and maybe it'll cause an aha moment or two for you. John 14, 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You see, Jesus tells us some things about himself in this verse that are crucial to believe and understand. If we anchor our faith and anchor our lives in what Jesus reveals in this verse, we can have complete confidence and peace that our present life and the life to come are secure. Now in verse 5, Doubting Thomas said to Jesus, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus responds in verse 6 by saying, I am the way. But he doesn't stop there. He also tells Thomas, I am the truth and I am the life. Because of those three attributes that Jesus possesses, he can rightfully say, No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Who is Jesus? He's the way, the truth, and the life. Now, as I said earlier, there have been many men over the years who have claimed to be Jesus Christ just as Jesus said they would. But only one man has demonstrated that he possesses all three of these attributes, and his name is the man, Christ Jesus. If you would, hold your place here. We'll come back at the end of the message. But for now, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. There is only one man who has demonstrated that he possesses the attributes of being the way, the truth, and the life. 1 Timothy chapter 2, being in verse 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. In this passage, we have the testimony of Scripture that both affirms and amplifies the fact that Jesus is the way. According to verse 5, the way to God is through a mediator. The scripture is very clear when it states that there's only one mediator between God and men, and his name is Christ Jesus. That automatically eliminates every other mediator. It automatically eliminates every sinner made a saint by other sinners. It automatically eliminates anything you or I can do to earn or merit heaven. In other words, it eliminates every other way. The man Christ Jesus fulfilled all the requirements of the law when he was on earth the first time, and he doesn't need any help from fallen man. That's why his last three words on the cross were, It is finished. Now Jesus told Thomas, He is the way in John 14, 6. Jesus also told him that he's the truth. Now in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4, we're told that God will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. It goes without saying that it's impossible to be saved unless we know the truth. However, 
knowing the truth is not good enough. Not only must we know the truth, God tells us we must come unto the truth. In other words, we can't just keep the truth at arm's length. We can't just rely on the fact that we know it intellectually and say, I'm good. We must come to the truth. It requires something of us. Romans chapter 10 and verse 10 says, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. It's much more than head knowledge. It's more than just knowing facts. By coming to the truth of the written word, we can also come to the truth of the living word. You see, you can't accept one and reject the other. You can't say, well, I believe in Jesus, but I don't believe in the Bible. Or the opposite, well, I believe the Bible, but I don't really believe that Jesus is the only way. You can't have it that way. That is against the scripture. In John chapter 1 and verse 1, it says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14 says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The Word is Jesus. The truth is Jesus. And we must come to the truth. Now, some of the imposters that I've read about were able to convince many people that they're the way to God. They also convinced many people that they have the truth. However, None of them have convinced anyone that they are the life. As I taught the children during our lessons on creation, life must come from life. God, who is from everlasting to everlasting, spoke the word and said in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 11, Let the earth bring forth grass the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. In verse 20, God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. In verse 26, God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Who is this awesome God? Who is this all-powerful being that has the ability to create and to give life by simply saying, let there be? What is his name? If you would turn to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Who is this all-powerful being that has the ability to create and to give life by simply saying so? Colossians chapter 1, beginning at verse 14. In whom we have redemption through his blood, that should be a hint, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of, that word image means likeness, who is the likeness, who is the representation of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Now let me stop right there and let me dispel some false teaching from a couple of the prominent cults in our day. Now when we think of the word firstborn, in our language today, in our understanding, we think the first person born to a family. I'm the eldest of five brothers. I'm the firstborn child in my family. That's how we normally think of firstborn. 
But in this verse, in this word, it doesn't mean that. And that's where the cults and the false teachers get it wrong. The word firstborn here is the Greek word protos. And it means prior to, before, foremost in time, place, order, or importance. In other words, Jesus is not a created being. Jesus is not the firstborn of the human family, as the Mormons teach. It's very important that we know what the words mean, because we can interpret them according to how we understand them today and get it totally wrong. And all we have to do is just look at the context, just look at the very next verses to see that this false teaching of Jesus being a created being is totally wrong. For by him, for by Jesus were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. <coughs> Jesus could not be a created being and have this ascribed to him. Life must come from the giver of life. None of the imposters and misleaders can create or give life. So who is Jesus? He's the word of God. He's the son of man. He's the creator and sustainer of all things. His name is wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. His name is Jesus, Jehovah, our Savior. His name is Christ, the Anointed One. His name is I Am, the Self-Existing One. When we know Jesus in this way, when we accept it as the unquestioning truth and receive eternal life from the giver of life, we then have an obligation and a command from God to share the way, the truth, and the life with others. Now, if you would turn back to our text in John chapter 14. Having this knowledge is good, but with it comes responsibility. And might I add accountability. As I said, for those of us who are truly born again, we have an obligation and a command from God to share who Jesus is, the way, the truth, and the life. It really makes it so simple. You can set all the other arguments aside for another day and focus your argument on one verse. And you can get rid of a lot of <coughs> rabbit trails. But in John chapter 14, Jesus continues teaching us in verse 12 and 13. Verily, verily, truly, truly, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, and let me pause right here. This is Jesus speaking. And he says, he that believeth on me. He didn't say in me. He said on me. Is that significant? Does that really make a difference? Is that really a big deal? Thank you. The devils believe and tremble. You see, as I said earlier... You cannot come to Christ unless you have the knowledge of the truth. We saw that earlier. But I also said that knowledge in and of itself is not enough. You can have all of the world's knowledge and be just full of knowledge and yet die and go to hell. Because believing in Jesus, now look at me, because I'm going to use my hands to give an illustration. Believing in Jesus 
is believing intellectually. The devils believe and tremble. But believing on Jesus is believing in your heart. And when you believe from the heart, with all your heart, it will change your life. It could be no other way. How can God live within and you still be the same? That's an impossibility. That's an oxymoron. That cannot be. Otherwise, the God that you profess to have is not omnipotent, but very weak. So Jesus used that word on purpose and for a purpose. And he said, he that believeth on me from the heart, not just intellectually, the works that I do shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Everything Jesus did was done to bring glory to the Father and to bring sinners to salvation through his sacrifice on the cross. Jesus tells us to do as he did. Now, as Pastor told us recently, Jesus did the hard work. He did the heavy lifting on the cross. There are different religions out there where they literally carry crosses and flog themselves till they're a bloody mess thinking that they're somehow pleasing God. Again, misinterpreting, misunderstanding scripture because they're taught by false teachers. Jesus tells us to preach the gospel, not inflict ourselves with all kinds of things like that. So as I close the message tonight, short and sweet, I'll leave us with some questions to ponder. Are we taking this command seriously? Are we? Those, those of us in this room that are born again. And by the way, I don't assume that everybody here is a Christian. I never make that assumption. That would be presumptuous on my part. Are we taking this command seriously? Are we asking Jesus to order our lives in such a way that we can obey his commands? If we're willing to obey the will of God, Jesus said, whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do. That's the context. Not name it, claim it. Not blab it, grab it. But in the will of God, doing the will of God. Another question. What's stopping us from obeying God? What's keeping us from doing more to bring glory to our Savior? You know what it is. You know exactly what it is. There may be several other things behind that one thing that you know what it is. But there's an elephant in the room. And you know what it is. And you hang on to it like a security blanket. And you won't let it go because it's your justification for not serving God and giving your all to him. But if you're willing to obey the will of God, Jesus said, whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do. All the power of God is available if you're willing to obey the will of God. Whatever it is that's stopping you, whatever it is that's hindering you, let God have it. Let God have it. And we sing the song, Have Thine Own Way, Lord. Have Thine Own Way, Lord. Not my way, but go ahead, have your own way. So I close with this. Who is Jesus? Who Jesus is to us individually. Pay attention to this. Who Jesus is to us individually will be demonstrated by our love for him and our obedience to his word. In verse 15, Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments. Who is Jesus to you?